So hello everyone. Good afternoon on behalf of everyone at Advocates for Equitable, Equitable Design Education. We would like to welcome you to our first Field Theories panel lecture. We are Cin Cindy Nashrin and Natalie Sandelli and we will be your hosts and moderators for today. Um, we'd also like to include a land acknowledgement. So in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work, and play on traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Tutana, the Stony Nakoda nations, the Métis nation, and all the people who make their home on the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. AEDE started as a response to current events such as the Black Lives Matter movement. AEDE strives to provide a safe platform to speak critically on inequities within design in the built environment, as well as the institutions that uphold them. Most importantly, we aim to broaden the social and political consciousness of SAPL students, faculty, and staff. Each month, the theme shifts to create a broad range of topics covered. This month's theme is Building and Dwelling. It will examine the right to dwell and the inequities leading to the very varying abilities for one to build and shape their environment. We begin to interrogate how design can be oppressive and speculate on how it can be a tool for liberation. Today, each of our local panelists will talk about how they brought a design initiative to life and reflect on their work connects to the community and has influenced their personal design philosophies. First, we'd like to give a brief introduction to our panelists this month before they begin their presentation and move into their discussion. Dr. Morris McCabe is a biomedical scientist turned innovation designer and community imaginist with her passions laying in transit, public spaces, play, and community involvement. Paige Boudreau is an accomplished television showrunner and filmmaker. Some of her directional voice can be witnessed in Mallory, Memphis, Nostromania, COVID Rocks, Friends Speak, and in her self published book, Curious. Erin Domenko is trained in zoology is a firm, former um, children's summer camp designer and currently works as an innovation designer for the City of Calgary Innovation Lab. Much of her passion lays in pushing people outside of their comfort zones to grow together. Megan Kirk, aka Jane Trash, is a Calgary-based artist currently exploring the realm of public, puppet, puppet fabrication and film. Much of her work explores the decline of our cultural value systems, touching on topics of conflating horror, sexuality, drug abuse, and our own mortality, communicated through the use of crude materials such as cardboard, acrylic, and found objects. Chris Kelly Frere is the Senior Innovation Designer and Manager of the Vivo Play Project at Vivo for Healthier Generations here in Calgary. His interests lay in the craft of leadership and the development of adaptive and resilient communities, empowering folks as they navigate change. Emily Kang was led to pursue landscape architecture as her career through the understanding of various relationships between people and their environments. She has an academic and field research experience in boreal re reclamation as well as practice as a landscape architectural technologist. Emily is currently pursuing her Master's of Landscape Architecture here at Sapple. And finally, John is um, currently in his final year of the Master of Architecture program here at Sapple. He completed his undergraduate degree from the UBC um, Fine Arts Department and has experience in residential and commercial design, the sharing economy, as well as age and place research. And before we get started, I just want to let you know that we'll be leaving this meeting open for a little bit longer afterwards if anyone has additional questions or if you just wanted to speak with any of the panelists. Without further ado, let's get started. Wonderful. Um, so I'm going to ask all the panelists to unmute themselves. Uh, my name's Chris, like uh, uh, Cindy and Natalie have kindly introduced all of us. Part um, of what we wanted to do was treat this like a conversation. And so um, I guess, you know, we'll be experimenting a little bit, a little bit with what it's like to have a bunch of people unmuted during the uh, call. But we thought it might be a fun way for you to hear of excitement or um, vacuum sounds in the background. Uh, I'd also invite anyone who is watching right now to put their camera on so that you can uh, maybe mute your phone. <laughs> the chaos begins. Uh, otherwise, we don't really get to see all the wonderful voices and people that are in the background. Um, if you know how, I'd encourage you to put on gallery view because then it feels a little bit more like a conversation. 
Um, and without further ado, we're going to get started. So a little bit of context about how this is going to run. Uh, like Natalie and Cindy said, we have a bunch of really cool change makers here. We have a community imaginist who is a shit server and makes green space master planning something that any community member can be a part of. We have a filmmaker who's comfortable interviewing, uh, uh, interviewing people who've been through horrific experiences, but also showing the joy in the light of a neighborhood. We have two amazing podcasters who are also students at the beginning of their careers. We have a uh, shit disturbing change making artist, like we said, who's exploring puppetry as well as fashion design and is Skyping in from a workshop. We have uh, someone who puts a blazer on miscellaneous nonsense at the city of Calgary, Aaron Domenko, um, who is helping to make government open to new ideas. Um, and are we missing anybody right now? No. <laughs> Wonderful. And we have our fabulous AEDE folks. Um, and myself, I'm up here at Vivo helping make mud and magic change the world. But we'll get into that later. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to hear some short stories from each of our panelists and then um, have a conversation about what this means uh, about getting shit done in the world and design philosophies and how we can take and use the approach of design as a way to transform the world around us. Are you all in the right meeting? <laughs> yes. If you're not, you should stay. Are <laughs> you? <laughs> All right. Okay, um, Aaron, we're gonna we're gonna hit this over to you. You let me know when you want me to change the screen. Uh, I will. I can do that. Thanks. Uh, oh my God, Ranger, no, stop! He literally the minute you said my name, he's like squeaky as toy and go. Okay, so <laughs> I'm gonna be talking with a squeaky toy as no, no. I'm just gonna take it, and we'll we'll see how that goes. Hello, everyone. I'm Aaron. I work at the City of Calgary. I'm an innovation designer. Next slide, Chris. I'm going to talk about designing through experimentation uh, and specifically a thing I did called Innovation Summer Camp. So I got hired at the City of Calgary straight from the Science Center where I used to develop summer camps um, to develop professional learning for people at the, at the city. Um, the idea is to try to turn everybody... You muted yourself. It said you muted me for the record. It said the host muted me. It wasn't me. Uh, <laughs> I don't know where I left off and my dog's chewing on my hand. This is a good start. Um, so I got hired at the city to develop a professional learning program to, with the idea of having every city staff be someone who's creative and innovative and who can try things differently and make things better. Um, and I had to figure out how to do that. And so one of the first things I tried was a thing called Innovation Summer Camp. Um, and that was where basically we asked a bunch of people what they needed. Um, I did a bunch of interviews. I tried to figure out what was standing between people and them being creative and innovative. And then I needed to try some stuff to see how that would work. Um, um, and I wanted to tell you a story about one of the things that I tried. Next slide. The thing that I tried was an experiment called Hack Your Boardroom. This is the description, very wordy. Um, the way these experiments worked is we cobbled together a rough description based on the thing we thought we wanted to try. And then I developed it a few days before or even like an hour before in some cases. Um, and some of them were, uh, you know, went, flew under the radar and some of them didn't. And this one was one of those. So I wrote this description. I sent it out to all the people who had done professional learning in the lab before. Uh, and then this happened. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, so yeah, it was a big thing. Uh, <laughs> so I wrote that description. To me, it sounds innocuous. What people were saying, what we heard over and over again was the innovation lab space is so cool. It's, there's like chairs you can move around. It's so interesting. I wish I could collaborate in a cool space like this all the time. And I was like, you can make any space like that. So let's do a workshop about that. Uh, and immediately I got a message from a friend of mine who works in the department that's in charge of our boardroom spaces. And he's like, hey, heads up, you're in trouble. And I was like, oh good. Uh, and then a bunch of managers sent me emails and then I had a whole bunch of meetings in my calendar to meet with managers and I, uh, you know, am, uh, you know, it was a little scary, but the cool thing that happened was I was able to meet with two different managers who I never would have met before, um, who are in charge of our boardroom spaces. And I learned so much. I learned we have a whole amazing policy about our boardrooms. I learned that our boardrooms are actually designed to be adaptable in ways that people don't usually know about. Um, they design those spaces so that everybody can use them. They design them to be equitable spaces. There's so much thought that goes into them that I honestly didn't even think of. Uh, and so here, and then here comes me being like, I'm going to change them all. Uh, and so it was a really fascinating learning moment for me. But of course, we did it anyway. Uh, and it looked like this. 
So I was able to talk them into using the spaces. Um, and these are what the spaces looked like. So um, basically people picked a topic they wanted to explore. They used th uh, a genre of material we call miscellaneous nonsense, which is like stuff Chris bought at the dollar store in 2005. Um, and they created these really cool spaces. People created uh, like a whole uh, like 80s vibe about Saved by the Bell. They created a hopscotch course. Um, they tried lots of really cool stuff. And I'd like to say that it was amazing and perfect, um, but then another thing happened. Uh, and that is this experiment. Uh, in this experiment, my coolest group on Arguably had music playing, fireworks on their screen. They hung stuff from the roof. They were like standing on a garbage bin, climbing onto the roof. And the boardroom I booked for them to use was right outside a really quiet group that has to do really focused, data-driven, intense work. Uh, right next to this group that was having fun and playing fireworks sounds. Uh, it was intense I got a really I got another email surprise uh, and they cc'd all of my managers and all of their managers and it was really great um, but I like I took a moment to just like freak out and throw up in a closet and then I composed a reply um, about how I really felt because the thing was their work no go back their work was really important and the things that they were doing um, really mattered and it was you know I like I, I should have known that they worked there but I didn't until I tried this experiment and so I sent them back a really thoughtful email to the point which was we're gonna consider all your feedback okay. We're, Funny, we're, you're making it. we're gonna do it again uh we're gonna do it again anyway um but we're gonna consider what you said so we didn't book that boardroom next time uh we learned a lot from them i made friends with another new manager which was really great um and uh we tried it again so the people the people in this experiment they learned a lot about changing spaces i learned a lot about what's possible in our boardroom spaces while still respecting the people who designed them um and i also learned a lot about our system and how people view experiments one of the really interesting things that happened in that complaint email was that person said it game playing was happening and that that wasn't respectful to their workplace which i thought was a really interesting way to look at creativity and innovation and changing spaces i more egg space was also my face just you know but i took a moment to explain to them why it felt that way and why sometimes creative work can feel high energy or can be a little bit loud um but why all those things are important so it taught me a lot about our space next one so my design philosophy is boiled out of that story uh just try it you probably won't die i like to design by experiments you don't know if a thing's gonna work until you try it so i like to try first and ask questions later um a, a quote that i really like for government is um if you're not if you're not doing something you don't have a strategy uh because government spends a lot of time planning the plan to plan the plan i've been to so many meetings like that and so um i like to model trying things first so i shared all of those foibles with that experiment with the people who tried the experiment so they could see modeling of not dying when you try an experiment uh, design with, not for. Um, it's not us versus them, it's or even us on behalf of them. When you're designing, it needs to be us with them. So we listen to people, we design with them, we bring them into our experiments to help them design. I should have brought in more of those managers to help me design, and I didn't, but I know to do that now. And the experiment taught me that and assume the best of everybody. Um, one thing I really loved from an IDEO article I read once was that when they interview people, they try very intentionally to, to fall in love with each person. Um, an easy thing to do with those manager emails would have been to freak out and hide under my managers. Um, but instead I met with them directly and I learned so much and I met so many cool people and I learned about people who are passionate about their work in all kinds of different ways. And I learned about who I should include next time. So um, I always, when I'm designing something, try to assume the best work with uh, and try things before I'm ready. The end. <laughs> I was way too long too, and I even talk. I talk at like one point seven five speed too. So, you're so <laughs> we're gonna just roll into the next story. So keep those flowing. Um, now we have uh, Jane Trash, Megan Kirk. I don't know if I should talk faster or if I should take a nap. I feel exhausted for everybody. Um, my name is Megan Kirk or Jane Trash. Um, I am not a designer. I fully agree with Erin when she said it is great to fail. I actually am the captain of a group called Team Useless, which is not a real group, but it's uh, me and my friends and every time we mess up, uh, we're just taking one for the team. And that's sort of been the philosophy of everything. Uh, here you're seeing a uh, gap tooth sweatsuit, which is a collaborative project with myself and my partner. I'm the one missing teeth. He's the one that doesn't take a sweatsuit off. So uh, that's where that name came from. It's all about collaborating with artists and getting them out of their comfort zone. So this is a shirt that we made with an artist called Sandra Mazaros, who works with uh, a lot of ink, a lot of um, work, and had never done an artist multiple like this before. So just sort of, I'm all about creating community and different types of communities. So for me, as an artist, working with an artist is great, but pulling them out of their comfort zone and forcing them to a different sort of practice where they get to reach a broader audience and a bigger community is kind of key for me. 
Uh, do you want to do next slide, Chris? Um, as soon as I graduated school, much to my parents' delight, I decided to be a hot dog queen, and uh, I worked at Tubby Dog for 12 years, from 2012 to 2017. Uh, in 2007, I became an owner and the manager, and this was major for me. I got to create community in such an immense way that was important to me. I love the music scene. And so this is a really hilarious shot from 2009, uh, The Monotonics. They were a rock band from Tel Aviv that were actually banned from Israel. They were too bad at um, They played so hard and so disgustingly. They were crowd surfed out of the restaurant by the crowd and we had to shut down traffic and it was awesome there i got to again not being a designer um apart from the joy of just cleaning a deep fryer i got to do web design i got to do posters i got to really make it a hub for all sorts of like music and art nerds and for me that was immense next slide chris chris slide yeah, um, so this is my newest project. Uh, I'm working on this with uh, four other friends. This is the Calgary Community Fridge, a project that is near and dear to my heart and physically near to my house, which is really great because community change has to start within your own community. So we knew that we had to design this to be something that was aesthetically beautiful because Calgary sort of like, ooh, poor people gross. Uh, but once you make it pretty and you put a mural on it, then you can get other people on board. Obviously there are a lot of people on board. I'm big on hyperbole. Um, but uh, not to be hyperbolic, but, but I do think that um, this is a really important project for me where I got to design how I wanted to engage with my community, how I wanted to engage with my community and create something that goes beyond my design, my desires, my ideas, and become something that is embraced by the community for the community. So since we've started this project, we've already seen different ways that people are engaging with it. They are maybe uh, going to the food bank and trading in product, bringing it here. But it's more about the food, more than about the food. It's about meeting people. It's sort of become the water cooler of the community, which is so important. And every time I go there to stock up or to clean, I meet so many people that are either donating or they're participating in taking food from the fridge. We're 24 hours, no questions asked, seven days a week. And so we really had to fight with like AHS and like Calgary Police Services. Uh, the landlords of neighboring businesses because they were sort of like, what do you mean you don't know who's there? What do you mean there's no hours? Um, but for us, 24-7 was so important because we didn't want people to feel like there were eyes on them. We wanted them to feel like this was them taking care of themselves in the best way that they could with their means available whenever it was convenient for them. So again, not really a designer so much as really just living off the passion of working with my community and I get to work with friends and I get to meet so many new people. So that is my philosophy is very much following my gut and not money. And that's it. Magical. Um, we are muting some folks just to try to limit the background talk. When it's your turn, we'll unmute you. We'll figure all that out. Um, okay. Our next story. Hey. Hello. Hello. Um, so, uh, kind of like um, Jane Trash, I am not a um, formal designer, but everybody sort of does design in their work. And so I wanted to share a little bit about what I do um, and kind of describe what a showrunner is so that you guys have a sense of um, how that works in the projects that I do. So on paper, a showrunner is the person who has overall creative authority or management responsibility for a television program or a film. Uh, I fill out all of these roles, these big 50 cent words, executive producer, director, field producer, blah, 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 blah. But really what I end up doing, Chris, next slide, um, is my job is to simultaneously protect the spark and the heart of a story while stewarding different tribes of people through the experience, uh, which is no small task. <laughs> and truly the type of stories that I uh, like to tell at the heart of it are people. And I think that the more specific and individual you get with a story, the more universal uh, the truth is that you end up telling. And so one of the projects that uh, last year I had a chance to work on was um, a true crime television series, which I feel like true crime is very polarizing for people. They either think like, well, that's super cool or are like super turned off of it because of the subject matter. And for someone who's gone through a lot of trauma, um, it's something that I'm really drawn to because I feel like helping other people be able to speak their truth is super, um important and so um chris actually i'll i have a little clip that i wanted to show with you guys but in the interest of time 
Um, I think I might actually skip it and I'll include the link in, um, in the chat box. You're good. We can show it. We're good? Okay. So uh, before we show this clip, I just want to give you guys a little bit of a preface. So within this clip, um, it showcases experts that we had to chat with um, while we were traveling. Um, it showcases someone that I spoke with who witnessed a crime um, or, or things unfolding over the years. And then we also did a bunch of what we call recrees or reenactment footage with actors. And so with each different sort of unit of people that we worked with, I had to steward them in a different way. So, um, you know, I, I had to really um, support, I, I guess, the person who we interviewed in this clip. Her name is Shelly Vineyard, and she lived across the street from 10 years of a family who systematically abused their children for decades and saw strange things happening over the years, but didn't um, come forward until after it was revealed what they were doing. And so, her purpose for speaking out in this documentary was to help other people understand what are red flags. That was what, why she wanted to, to speak. And so maybe let's just watch the clip and see um, how all of those different pieces came together. And then I can chat a little bit more about my design philosophy behind telling this story. Okay, I'm going to get it going. And uh, if please tell me if, it does, if the sound is not coming through, someone say those words. Basically, the Turpin family, when they lived in Texas, they didn't have any dealings with the people that lived around them. They had very little dealings. I mean, once in a while, there'd be an incident where David Turpin would have to take care of something, an animal problem or whatever, and the neighbors would, would see him. But they really didn't understand what was going on inside that house. It was just a terrible mess. One of the children, the oldest girl, tries to run away. And she's successful. She makes it to the road and she flags down a car. The day that I saw Jennifer and thought she might be running away, I was coming from here, heading for the school that way. And she came out of this fenced area here, I was already turned and it hit me that it was probably Jennifer, but then an old pickup truck came up and saw her and stopped for her and it looked like she was getting a ride with her. Assumably she's telling her some of this kind of things that are happening and this person apparently just doesn't believe it. I would say between four and five miles through rough terrain, just to try to get away to save herself and her siblings. So that's the clip. And so for Shelly speaking, she had a much different motivation for, for telling her story or a different reason for telling her story than, um, you know, our, our, cult expert Rick Ross, then our forensic psychologist. Um, so just trying to, to bring all of those voices together in a coherent story. And Chris, if we can go to the next slide. Um, during my time working with them and, and really working on film in general, some of the things that I realized is that people want three things. People want to be listened to, people want to feel special, and people want your undivided attention. And this is universal across film, across anything that um, I feel like people are lacking this in their day-to-day -day life right now. And everyone has a story to tell. Everyone has something going on with them that in our day-to-day -day interactions, we don't really have a chance to share. And so I feel like with film, and it can stretch to other areas as well, giving people a platform and an opportunity to share that about themselves. And honestly, like think about the last time that someone gave you their undivided attention for more than five minutes at a time. Like if you can give that gift to someone that is like worth its weight in gold and then some. And so that sort of, is, I was able to put a fine tip on that point during this because so many people in the true crime space, whether it's survivors or someone like Shelly who just, um, you know, was on the periphery of this has this, complex like guilt, disillusionment, like all of these different things that 
by listening to them, by making her feel important, making her feel special and giving her my undivided attention um, was a gift to her and a gift to, to others, to the viewers, to, to other people who, who want and need to hear this story because they might be able to prevent something like this from happening. And so I think that moving forward with all of my projects, those have been my principles. And I'll just give another quick story and then I'm done, I promise. Um, during the pandemic, I, um, you know, filming, you're in close quarters a lot of the time. So it's hard to create, but as an artist, I mean, that's kind of, I have this insatiable like desire to create all the time. And so I noticed while walking out in my community, people had been painting little rocks and leaving them around on pathways and, and places where people would walk. And it was just beautiful, especially in the beginning of the pandemic to see people trying to reach out when we couldn't have, have that connection. People still wanted to be listened to. People wanted to make others feel special, you know, and have that moment of connection. And so I put a call out on a few community Facebook groups. Hey, if you guys are creating these rocks, I'd love to do a little story about this. And the response was incredible. I got over 20 different submissions of videos and, and photos of people just doing this simple little task of painting rocks and leaving them in their community. And I was able to weave it back into this beautiful story that actually tomorrow is screening at the Airdrie Film Festival. And, and it's just awesome to have been able to take this story that people were doing, connect them together, and then share it back to them, share it with the world. And so um, that's kind of what I do. And that's what I believe in is, is giving people a platform to be listened to, have undivided attention, and feel special. Wonderful. <laughs> Sorry, I was muted there for a moment. Um, I don't know how to follow that because I feel sad now. I felt energized before, but I now feel a little bit sad. So um, I'm going to make everybody happy again because basically what I do is I try and make things happen in the community. Um, creating Coventry came out of a, a desire to not see our playgrounds and parks disappear. Um, and I pretty much put it to the city that, you know, if I could make things cheaper, could we keep all of our parks? And they were like, sure, thinking we could never do it. But we have. Um, so out of all of this, I'm going to just talk about kind of the things that I learned from it um, that are pretty much design principles that go across. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Um, First of all, you have to listen and learn. So following on from what Paige said, you really need to listen to people. Um, there's no point in designing something or building something if it doesn't work for the end user. Um, so you need to actually listen to what they need before you design something. And then, uh, what have I got here? Okay, next slide. And then once you've actually listened and heard, put it all together and confirm it. Go back out to the people you spoke to and say, you know, this is what I heard, but I just have a few more questions because I guarantee you, you will have a few more questions <laughs> um, because people will surprise you. They'll tell you things that you never thought of. I don't care what kind of expert you are people will always surprise you with things you haven't thought of. And then once you've modified that, learn how to break the rules. I know there are rules, but it doesn't mean you actually have to follow them. <laughs> <laughs> you can do it differently. So, I mean, most community, this is a picture of basically us going out to the community and saying, what do you want? So we literally drew some stuff on an old poster board and went out and said, right, where, where do the dog walkers go? Let's find out what the dog walkers want. Um, holding something and expecting people to come to it and getting them to book, you're never gonna get a broad range of people in the community so you're all about being equitable go to where the people are that's like my number one tip is go to where the people are do it differently like make yourself stand out and then so i'm actually from the northeast of england and we have a saying that's like shy bands getting out and it basically means 
shy children don't get anything. So ask. There's no harm in asking. The worst that can happen is somebody says no. And actually, that's not even a bad thing because if you ask them why they said no, then you can find a way around that. <laughs> um, the reason we have pictures of garbage cans with little poop bag holders on them is because that's technically not allowed by bylaw. And um, you are not allowed to stick anything to a garbage can. Um, but we did it anyway, and then we told them we'd done it. And they said, oh, that's a really good idea. But by law, you know, if we get any complaints, we'll have to remove them. And I was like, that's like 10 bucks worth of dollar store containers. It's not the end of the world <laughs> if these get removed. And the community love them. They think it's fantastic. They want me to do it all over the community. So you know what? Just try it. Even if it breaks the rules, try it. You can always apologize afterwards. And then next slide. I know everybody says that the big picture, the concept is really important. And it, it is, I'm not saying it's not, but sometimes the little minutiae actually matter more than the concept. Now, the reason we have this picture up is because I spearheaded putting some picnic tables out in a utility corridor that we also don't have a permit for, but- Harder than you would think. <laughs> it is a lot harder than you would think. Um, but when we came to paint it, I thought we'll do something bright. And I went out and I knocked around the neighbor's doors and asked them what they wanted and we posted on Facebook. And it wasn't until we posted the colors that people came back to me and they're like, oh my God, whatever you do, don't paint it yellow. <laughs> and I was like, but why? And they said, because it's going on the grass in the utility corridor, there are so many mosquitoes on that grass, it's just gonna become polka dot. Because <laughs> apparently mosquitoes are really attracted to yellow. So, you know, something that small as choosing the paint color could have destroyed the entire project because then nobody would have used it because it would have just been a muzzy pit. Um, and the last thing is create something beautiful. And I always say, create something that your mom would be proud of, right? If, if your mom, if you're gonna do something, don't do it half-assed, just make the effort and make something that you really would love to like send a picture of or pick the phone up to your mom and just go, hey mom, this, like, this is fantastic. Guess what I did? Um, and if you keep that as, as what you're aiming for, you're not gonna go wrong. That's me. Beautiful, Morag. Okay, so we've got John and Emily are going to tag team their uh, their story. So I'll uh, kick things off. As mentioned before, uh, John and I are students of Sapple and we are also the hosts of the Sapple Design Matters podcast. And um, something we get asked every now and then is why did we want to do this? And this podcast really came from a place of curiosity and trying to understand other designers and how they were really successful in the fields that we want to go into. So we're going to be going into our third season. We've revamped the program entirely, um, but we are completely volunteer run um, by students and we have a partnership with our university uh, radio station, CGSW. And uh, we dive into the heads of designers by framing our questions around sort of three broader questions, which are what do our guests value? Um, what is their process like? And we like to wrap things up with why does design matter? And we always get very interesting answers out of that. Um, so we, out of these conversations and interviews that we've had with our guests, uh, there's a couple of design lessons and philosophies that we've derived out of them. And uh, we're gonna share some of those with you. Next slide. Right, so we had the opportunity to sit down with Walker McKinley, who's an architect designer in, uh, in Canada. 
And whenever we kind of go into these conversations, we like to keep them as loose and organic as we can to sort of generate conversation within rather than just getting question and answer for 30 minutes. Um, so you never really know where they're going to go. So, but they always kind of turn out to be kind of good conversations. And I think for me, it's interesting kind of talking to these designers who are highly successful, very, very, you know, um, decorated in their field and to see if, you know, me being the sort of shit disturber in training with school right now, can I relate to this guy? Like, can we have a conversation? Like, can we just kind of have a tan tangential kind of conversation? So go through talking with him. It was very interesting to kind of hear um, how he kind of got through the world and got sort of successful. And so he met his partner. Um, so he runs the firm McKinley Burkhardt. He met Mark Burkhardt back in school when they were doing school um, over a love of cigars. So that started it. And then they had a couple more and a couple more. And then it kind of designed, and then it kind of turned into a friendship. And then they're also really, you know, really brilliant designers. And then they got offered contracts. And literally one thing led to another. And now they have this like, very, very kind of prestigious, cool um, firm that everyone kind of likes. Well, I guess it's dependable. But, um, you know, another one was uh, Russell Acton. So Acton Austri. That was another episode we did. And his partner was just sort of, um, uh, that he did with his firm was just sort of uh, they liked kind of talking to each other they liked talking about design so I guess you know never turn down a good conversation you never know who you might talk to who you might bump into who you might learn from and I think that if you're never kind of one to try a conversation I mean you might who knows start a firm with this person start to, to, to design thing with them or like start to disturbing some of the kind of the urban fabric so um, they found they found success creatively together. So I guess in design, finding good conversations is important in order to listen, learn, share, and progress. And it seems like those are some other kind of keys that some other um, people on the panel have kind of talked to already or talked about already. Um, you know, you need a willingness uh, and desire to reach out for good communication and listen. It takes a little bit of guts to say, you know, hey, what are you about? What, you know, what's going on with you? And just have casual conversation before you kind of hit like, the bigger, wider kind of types of, of conversations. And personally, I think through conversing, I talk a lot. I've always been kind of pegged as an extrovert. Maybe that's why we started this podcast. I just need more people to, to talk to. Um, but, you know, I always try conversation to try through talking with someone that I don't know or a stranger, whether they're highly successful or whatever. Um, I find it very easier. The more I talk to them, the more I get to know them is the more I get to see myself in them potentially and to me i think that's a really good way of connecting with people so the more i see myself in everyone on the planet the more i can maybe design for them or understand them or see where they're coming from and i feel like it'd be really impossible if you just if i didn't do that if i wasn't talking um so sorry you can go through next slide now now, speaking of talking, um, another lesson was if you have a voice, use it often. And that's uh, something that I think Kate Thompson uh, embodied really well. Uh, those that are from Calgary know that she is the CEO and president of CMLC, a fairly powerful player in the uh, uh, urban design development field. And um, you know, she's a woman that is at the top of the ladder in a field that's mostly dominated by men, uh, which gives her a very powerful voice in the industry. And she uses it very strategically, at least that's also the way I see it. Um, so it is a voice that has been hard won and she does use it often. She's always at events speaking as the lecturer or maybe you've had her as a uh, jury uh, panelist on one of your crits if you're in architecture. Um, so. I asked her about um, how she uses her voice in, in the interview well, that is yet to be released, uh, but it really comes from Kate's core value of uh, treating people as she would expect to be treated with fairness, uh, equality, and respect. And, you know, why is it important to treat people as you expect to be treated? Because we're all human. Um, we need to make opportunity and room for failures, mistakes, and also celebrating the successes uh, that should not be measured on the basis of uh, our gender, but also but based on the merits of our actions. And as designers, we need to learn how to articulate and express what we value and also the voices um, of the people and communities that share our ideas and advocate for them. So lending a voice or giving a voice um, and using it and using it often is something that we need to practice. Next slide. 
Um, so another one is designing with courage. As young designers, I think we're sort of finding our voice and how we design. Um, we had a gentleman by the name of Hernan Diaz Alonso, who's from SciArc. You know, they're known as the ninth best architecture school in all of North America, and they want to. They tell you that every time when they. That's like their slogan, basically, for their school. Anyways, we had the director of architecture come in. I was watching every movie I could to try to get a sense of, you know, what's this guy about? He's highly theoretical. Half the stuff just, I couldn't understand at all. And I was like, hey, what are we going to talk about? Like, you always have these anxieties. Like, what if the conversation goes nowhere? And then I have a dud. What do we do with a dud episode? Neil. So, I mean, he sat down and it, it took a little bit to kind of break the ice and kind of warm up. And then, you know, kind of got talking. And I think he started to understand the episode. And a big part of the episode with me was, we had all these questions and concern, but a big one was, you know, he, he makes all these very organic forms and things like that. And I just look at it and I go, you know, how do you think that way? How do you design that way? Like, why, why is this successful? So I, I was really using the episode as my own kind of data mind to figure them out, but I was intimidated by that. I thought, you know, he could be, um, you know, he could feel insulted. Like I had no idea how the conversation was going to go. So at one point it, it sort of clicked for me. He says, you know, the world designs in 90 degrees. He just doesn't. He just wants these organic forms. He wants to design with human. He wants to design with nature. He wants to like, you know, makes these kind of viral looking things. So I guess getting back to the kind of ingredient is design with courage is sort of loosely sort of said, but in this sort of um, uh, slide that we're looking at right now, on the left, you have David Shipperfield, very, very, you know, um, practiced architect designed perfectly and mass and has mastered the 90 degree beautiful buildings simple buildings we can all relate and on the right you have a building concept by Hernan Diaz Alonso again beautiful again subjective but I guess the point that I'm making is us as young designers and I guess as designers and activists out there with a designer voice is design with courage so there is no real right answer I think as long as you sort of have a vision and go with it and try to see it to the end you might hit a bump or two, but you kind of need to keep moving with what you're looking for. So, you know, innovation is imperative to design. Um, and then one thing that Hernan said that I, I, I always think about is he, he told us as students to be bold, be impatient, be you, and take a chance to explore something new. I mean, right now, as we're kind of in, in school, it's that kind of like fail forward mentality and try to fail as much as you can before you go out in the real world where you can't really fail as much. So right now it's like, you know, we're in school for three years. Uh, be as courageous as you possibly can. Try to find your voice in order to be able to use it and exercise it when you're out in the real world, which we can't wait to get to. So um, thank you. That's it for our slides. Chris, we want to thank you really much for having us on the panel. And thank you for AD, AD, AED for bringing this all together. Up to you, Chris. Awesome. Well, I'm going to kind of carry that story about how even when you think you're in the real world and you think you have a voice, sometimes it can go wrong. Um, I'm going to tell a really short story about a small piece of one of the projects that I get to be a part of with Morag, as well as a couple other of my colleagues. Um, Greg Stein's on the line too, and our other colleague, Anthony Bork. We're part of the Vivo Play Project, which is about bringing old fashioned, unstructured play, like getting in the mud, getting your hands dirty, back to the suburbs. Because right now, the way we build our cities is making people sick. And the way we build our playgrounds is boring. And so to help make that better, we drop storage cubes into neighborhoods full of what we call loose parts. So that's kind of like the miscellaneous nonsense Aaron brought up. Um, and we uh, train people called play ambassadors to encourage people to be human, right? To, to play in beautiful, messy, open-ended ways, which is also sort of what I think design is about. Um, so this is a picture of Anthony standing beside our first storage cube. We dropped it into the park and we were so excited. We were like, oh my God, this is amazing. The storage cube is in the park. And we had done some work to say, well, what are we going to put on the outside? And the communities, like Morag already mentioned, were nervous about what goes on the outside. And so we thought, we're going to put a really good, clear message. We're going to get a stencil and from half a kilometer away, it's going to say, come play. And then if we want, we can say like, come play Sunday at one o'clock. So it works as advertising. People drive by, we thought this will be great. 
So you can imagine Morag and myself are outside. Um, the team is starting to set up the hub. We're painting it in white paint and we realize partway through we've got the wrong paint. We don't have gal like galvanized steel primer. We have regular metal paint primer. We're like, it's gonna be fine. We're gonna keep going. So we put that on. We put our stencil on the side of the thing and we start peeling it off just to see if it's gonna come off so we can put nice clean words, come play. And as we pull the stencil off, big sheets of paint start to peel off. We're like, oh, okay, pivot. We pivot, we're a design team. We pivot, no problem. So you know what? We're gonna hand paint this sign. And we thought that'll be whimsical. That'll be beautiful. That'll be fun. That'll be easy. And so we started hand painting and we're like, you know what? This looks good. It looks fun. It's kind of like a carnival. This looks, this looks like a hand painted sign. Well, this is what it turned into. <laughs> and the next day, <laughs> We were still trying to convince ourselves that this didn't look like a horror movie. This looked like a whimsical children's place. <laughs> and I will tell you that the community Facebook group did not share our view. <laughs> uh, I'm dying. Oh my God, you made a murder cue? <laughs> I'm dying. It's so funny. <laughs> and within about 48 hours, we had hundreds of comments. People were photoshopping pictures of this. Oh, <laughs> it was insane. Yeah. You can see this. It just kept going on and on and on and on, which was kind of amazing. And that's where um, John got really excited by this next slide. I think we discovered a third typology to go along with Robert Venturi's um, model of it. Is the building a duck, a decorated shed? Um, we think that it could also become a landmark. <laughs> And so um, we've discovered that we can actually lean in. Um, and this week, uh, we're planning to actually go out there um, with serial killer letters and write something else. Because what's happened is by messing up, by doing something like stupid and imperfect and being overconfident, we've triggered a conversation. And it actually identified a design need, which we hadn't thought about before, which is how do you make something iconic? Maybe that last word should be iconic, not love mark. But um, this question of making something iconic becomes really important when you want people to go play at a certain place. Because I know we all remember probably like the Red Slide Park or the airplane something. Like I'm looking for nods, but we like you have those icons in our head. And by messing up, we have inadvertently created a conversation that has led that funny murder cube <laughs> to become an icon. And so for me, this helps um, identify some of the pieces that are part of my personal design philosophy. The first one and the overarching one is that mess is magic and that the world is messy. And our role as designers is to help walk with people through the mess. Um, I believe in being a mad poet and letting the story unfold, being an empath and getting to the heart of the matter matter and not being afraid of those tough conversations, those inadvertent murder cubes. <laughs> um, and um, letting yourself feel your power and being a dark wizard so that you can explore the edges of what we're comfortable with. Um, and that's what uh, I think can really help unlock some magic in design. Um, so with that, we're done our stories. Um, we're not doing too bad for time, but uh, I would love to open it up to the panelists um, to share some reflections. And what I'm really curious, because you haven't really heard each other's stories before, is uh, popcorn style, anyone can talk whenever they want, to jump in and say, um, what stands out to you? What was, what was um, common among these stories? What was really different? If no I love that we're all so comfortable to just like fuck up. Like I think that's so important. And I think I have learned so much from that. And I always think that it seems so bizarre or people uh, are really questioning the fact that you are so comfortable in, you need humility to be able to screw up like that. And I love that everyone on the panel was like, that's my number one learning tool. I totally agree. I listened to this true crime podcast and one of the quotes that they say quite often is, it doesn't need to be perfect, just fucking do shit. And that I'm like, that is my motto. And that is the difference between getting stuff done or not. And John, what you were saying, like you gotta just fail fast. That again is my motto too, because if you, you can plan as much as possible, but if you don't ever move forward, then you don't have time to fix it because you spent all this time in this limbo, right? So I, I'm all about the failing fast and, and messing up and, and figuring it out. <laughs> 
I'm gonna just start just just fuck up. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that. That's it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, I, a thread that I heard that I thought was really interesting too is uh, like a lot of people reference courage or bravery or like the what it takes to do that because it's not it's not easy to make those mistakes mm -hmm. uh, and I think that that came up that came up a few times for sure I have to I'm not gonna lie John I was really triggered when you said that you need to screw up as a student because you can't as a grown up that's not true don't buy into the that hype that, mm -hmm. that's like capitalist propaganda it's fine I mean you can't you can't screw up like maybe don't build a bridge that's gonna collapse you have to do your screw ups <laughs> before that but other than that <laughs> no I'm looking forward to many more mistakes. I think as long as you own your screw up and learn from it, then it's not a problem. Mm -hmm. And there are, I mean, I'm sure like accountants don't like to screw up because that messes things up, but like That's most, yeah. Look at the stock market. Totally. Look at their economy. They have clearly messed up. Yes, I guess. They're probably not happy about it though. The one thing I heard was people centric. Everybody's story centers around people and listening to people, having those conversations. That's just, I always feel that's like the most important thing when you're designing anything is to have that two-way conversation. I totally agree. I mean, it doesn't matter how successful you are. If you're just doing it on your own, you have no one to share it with. You have nobody to benefit yeah. from it. You have nobody to share that joy with. And so really like truly what John was saying about just those conversations, hitting that home uh, and just talking to people in your community, in your projects that you're working with, um, it just makes everything so much more enjoyable and moving forward with joy while you're designing is going to make you something that's so it's so genuine that people can't really deny it. If you're just designing to accomplish one single goal without asking people, without thinking about the broader spectrum, like that's such a, even if the project is successful, like, is it really, if it's a failure that aren't engaging the rest of the community? I think maybe like one interesting kind of question that I'm kind of revolving around lately is, um, you know, we're going into the third season of this podcast and one of the big, huge kind of overlying theme of what we're going to do is like how to listen and how to listen better. And I get, I think that's kind of like a vague question that I'm kind of curious with, with what everyone's kind of answers to that. Like, how do you become a better listener? I think genuinely caring all the time. And that's like easier said than done. But, um, I found, especially when on the road, we were a small crew and you're thinking about a lot of things. Where are we going to get lunch? When's our flight tomorrow? Da, da, da. Do we have to go pick up this piece of gear? All this stuff. But if you're able to, and it's almost like practicing, like I practice at home with my husband all the time, is you have all this stuff in your head. But when you sit down, if you can just, you know, let that go for a moment and know that in this time, you know, nobody needs anything. Nobody wants anything. The only thing that, the, my only job right here in this moment is to hear what you have to say. And also, I guess, like, I am truly curious about everyone. And I, I forgot who said it first, but to, there is no bad conversation. There's no waste of a conversation. And so um, I feel lucky in my job because I get to meet so many people that I would never otherwise have the opportunity to speak with. And so I get to learn people that you know, work in oil and gas or work in the Vivo Play Place or like, you know, I, I don't usually talk to architects or whatever, right? But I, I get to learn and I get to, because I think I'm curious, be curious about people because then whatever they're talking about is suddenly the most fascinating thing you've ever heard. And so I think like when I reframe it that way that I'm not listening to them talk about whatever, like I don't have a huge interest in oil and gas, but I do a lot of corporate videos, but I'm interested in them and what right. they have to say that reframes it for me. So I don't know if that helps, but I think Spark for me, Paige, where you said that, which is sort of this mindset that, and it's hard to cultivate, but I can't tell you how many times I feel like I'm working on a design challenge or a project, and I look over and I'm like, this Tupperware, it's holding the key. <laughs> and I actually have started to recognize that that's, it's not just that I'm lucky to have things around me, it's the mindset you bring to it, <laughs> and that you, need, that you need to find a way to cultivate a mindset where whatever is at hand is valuable. 
And I think that that's one of the risks we have and one of the challenges we have in the design field is that we don't do that. So then when people are the thing that's next to you, you don't think that they hold the key. Just looking in the chat and they're saying about going back and confirming that what you heard was actually what you heard rather than risking assumptions. Why not? It's another chance to have a conversation and a piece of cake, right? Like just, just biases, whether we want to admit it or not. Um, and what you think you heard might not actually be what you heard, or maybe the person's just not used to describing what it is they want um, or what they're trying to tell you. So just be gentle and tease it back out. There's no harm. Totally. And I think that that shows vulnerability from you to go in and ask and, and you're being, when you're vulnerable and empathic to them, you're like, Hey, I want to hear more about what you have to say. That again, is that gift back to them. And if you're vulnerable, they want to be vulnerable, give you additional information. They feel safe to tell you what's really going on. And you can go a level deeper, kind of like what you were saying more with the colors of the um, picnic table. If people had just said, don't do it yellow. You're like, I don't know why, but by going back and asking, you're like, Oh, this totally makes sense. Makes sense. Right. I know. Yeah. Yeah. And then it sparked a whole conversation about something else that the community wanted. And we ended up talking, I think, about a dog park and stuff like that. You never know where a conversation is going to lead, right? Mm -hmm. What are you thinking, Emily? Well, I'm thinking how, like, uh, at first, the sort of the crux of a lot of this dialogue is the emphasis on conversation, as Marek had mentioned, and how... I'm like, I'm not as extroverted as John. I'm more like a, the type of person who sits and steeps with ideas for a little while, then maybe I'll throw something in there, which is why John and I work so well together. Like we, when we were composing this, um, these slides in this quick presentation the other day, I made the comment that John likes to extend and I like to parse back and we have a balance. And we also bring two very different perspectives together. And I really enjoy collaborative work. And, and I see it in other people's uh, work here in the panel, how, we engage not just other people in terms of making a thing or making something happen, but like getting to the heart of what they uh, are trying to express, right? And maybe we come up with a way to synthesize their ideas. Like, don't ever think that not being forward is a bad thing. It's not. You're probably a better listener than John. Sorry, John. Just because you do sit back and you take it all in. Whereas I'm probably more like John. I'm like, to, I like to talk, right? Um, so we're, it's hard. we've just hit one o'clock and I want to give each of the panelists a chance to say, you know, kind of a closing, closing piece of advice or a bit of whisper or maybe even a question you're sitting with. That might be a better thing. I'm curious, what are you curious about next? Um, Jump in when you're feeling ready. I guess I feel hopeful. Maybe it's not so much a question. I, f I love how many similarities there are across people who are not typically designers. This conversation that we're having and a lot of the comments that are coming from the viewers as well is there's just so much similarity. And I, I'm really hoping that this joy of collaboration and community goes forward in such a positive way with COVID and everything that's happening right now. And I guess I'm hopeful of no returning to the the normal you know um and seeing sort of like how this is going to lift us all up in a positive way i'll jump in um i think it's interesting it's like posing the question like if we're if as designers or as people or as conversationalists like if, if we're kind of interested all of us on this panel in like listening and critically listening and and you know mining kind of data while listening to people and stuff like that and being interested naturally interested in order to progress better with understanding people like is that the kind of age that we're in right now is kind of like shit disturbers is to listen right like kelly you're saying you put that depth cube out there and you're just like oh i'm listening so much to everyone talking now rather than just being like i don't need to listen to a word they're saying my death cube is the best thing right so are we like in an age of listening now in terms of like really trying to understand like the urban fabric or whatever and then if that's the case now like what 
what did we used to be at? Like, have we not been able to listen enough in the past or is like listening a new thing? Like, what? <laughs> I don't know. I just find that kind of interesting how it's sort of important now, at least for us and then the broader range of other activists, designers, whatever you call them. We kind of in the same vein as John is, is it the way that we are listening is very different and how can we kind of push like the what what we're doing in terms of how we listen to each other and the things that we consider and critically think about different opinions that are not our own and other communities. How do we bring those ideas and put them in place for the future and make room for them in the future. I've been thinking a lot just based on this conversation and I think more where you talked about like don't believe all of the boundaries that you think are in that you think are there aren't actually there or all the rules that are there um, and and in filmmaking I mean we break rules and do things and our whole thing is movie magic but it's still interesting that you know, there are so many things and it almost goes to what we were saying with the listening too. like you have all these assumptions you believe like, oh, this is the way it is. And so this is how it has to be. But if you start pushing on that boundary, you realize it's a fake wall, you know, and so I just think that's like so important to remember that. Um, yeah, there are so many boundaries in this world right now that wherever we're coming from that we believe are there that aren't really there. And that's how that's how we're becoming, you know, shit disturbers and change makers is by pushing down those fake walls and uh, revealing what's actually possible. I don't know, I, I don't have a lot to say other than I love the fact that I'm not weird because you're all weird too. <laughs> weird is good! <laughs> right? Good. It's just... Normal is boring. It's true. Right? And completely but, relative. <laughs> but that's it. It's 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 nice to know that there are so many different places in the world where this is happening, um, where people aren't just interested in chasing dollars. They're interested in making sure it fits for the people that need to use it. I I just yeah, warms my heart. Erin, last word? Uh, I guess I'm on the way out, I'm thinking a bit about listening strategically and the different ways that you can listen to people because I heard a bit about like leaving quiet space for people and letting them fill that space to see what they have to say and um, and about um, making sure that people are heard so that you hear what their, what their stories are because everybody's story kind of comes out from a different angle sort of in the way that Paige was sharing. But then I'm also thinking about murder cubes and like sometimes <laughs> Um, I mean that in all sincerity, sometimes you need to give them a murder cube and then listen, you know, because that explosion of like memes and placemaking and like fantastic opportunities and weird things that happened there happened because you tossed out a murder cube, right? Like if you, <laughs> if you had gone to people and said, does your neighborhood need a murder cube? They probably would have said no, but, but like you learn, you learn so much, you know what I mean? Like, I guess there's a balance for me because I think that designing with is important and listening is important, but also sometimes I think maybe you just have to throw out a murder cube. You need an icebreaker. <laughs> <laughs> you need to blow something because up. Are you gonna are you gonna get the unexpected without starting there? Not always, I think maybe. So definitely disturbing some shit, that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll turn it back to Natalie and uh um, our lovely AEDE uh, stewards to close this out. Thank you for having us. Um, so we would just like to close this off by giving a big thank you to our lovely panelists, um, the stories that they told, as well as the people who attended and supported our first Field Theories panel lecture series. Um, thank you so much. And once again, feel free to stay if you have any um, questions or want to chat for a bit. Otherwise, have a great rest of your day, and we hope to see you next month. And then you go out and consult with people. So basically you tell them, this is what we're doing. And wait to see what people say. You're not actually going to change anything, but, but you're listening to them. Um, and I think what's happened 
I've kind of noticed, especially in the last sort of five to 10 years, is institutions are actually listening. Um, it doesn't really matter when you've got tons of money and you can afford to make mistakes and just build something else somewhere else. But when dollars are short, you need to make sure that what you're doing actually counts. Mm -hmm. So just as an example, um, my, the Creating Coventry project, we have 14 park spaces in the, in the community that are gonna need renovating over the next 15, probably 15 years now. We didn't know where to start. Um, but the one thing that came forward was teens were getting lambasted on Facebook for hanging around. I mean, they're not doing anything. They're just hanging around. They're hanging out. They have nowhere to go. They can go to Vivo, but if they don't have money, then what do they do? They just hang around. So they all said, look, we want a basketball court. And we said, well, hang on, there's basketball hoops everywhere. No, no, we want a court. We want to be able to play games. So we fundraised, we built a basketball court. And I'm not kidding you, before we even painted the tarmac, that court is empty when it gets dark. I am so glad we didn't put lights in. <laughs> but it's that listening to the community because that would, you know, we could have built whatever we wanted. We could have built a fantastic playground that nobody used. And um, we have unused playgrounds all over the, all over the community. In fact, all over the area because they're all the same. Mm -hmm. So and I it's that listening to people and, and understanding why they want what they want. Right. I, I think what that makes me think about too more is, is orienting around a shared and common purpose. Yeah. And whether or not that shared and common purpose is of the greatest benefit to the community. And for a long time, shared and common purpose has been making more money. Those playgrounds were all built to sell houses. They were great for that. They weren't actually there to help kids, help teenagers, make people healthy, none of that. And I think and design great. has long time been like that. And it's the same with the the, cul-de-sacs with the really wide roads. They, they weren't built to build community. They were built to make it quicker and easier to drive downtown or for fire engines to come in and... Or for parade of show homes. Right. Yeah. But it's... I think that's why the, it's so important to get to the root of the why why do people want what they want yeah yeah i think it also highlights like the fact that oftentimes we don't listen to the right people like in the case of the basketball hoops and basketball court if you didn't listen to the kids then it would have never been there and they would mm -hmm. still be hanging around and you guys might have done something else and it wouldn't have been used and you'd been like why why aren't they using it it's right there but all and they wanted was a basketball court and yeah. And that's so. it. And it's totally like, it's totally right. And that's why I was saying like, go to where the people are because we held so many like engagement and co-creation sessions and we got the same kinds of people. And we're like, well, where are all the seniors? Where are all the teens? Like we know that these people need things in the community. So where are they? they just don't feel comfortable. They don't feel like they have a voice. Mm -hmm. So until you give them a voice by going to them, they're actually quite surprised. And, and I actually had a few teams say, thank you for asking us, which, oh my God, it's like, really? Like, does nobody ever ask you anything? This is for you. But yeah, people don't ask. What are you thinking, Natalie? I think everyone has like some interesting points on this. I think what Cindy was saying is really relevant. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that like you really have to make sure you're talking to the people who it's actually for, um, making sure that their voices are heard, especially when we're talking about like marginalized communities and people who often um, aren't reached out to and had their voices heard. So 
I think that like what you're doing with your work, especially with like the basketball net, like that's a really good example. Like it's a small thing, but it shows like how that affects the community on like a fairly large scale, especially like the teenagers are obviously like a fairly important part of the community. They're gonna be the future leaders. So seeing how they have something to like channel their time and energy into, I think that that's important to see that our communities are being shaped like that. I appreciate there was a so there was a comment. Was just gonna say, <laughs> <laughs> no. One expected benefit of that as well is on Saturdays now the Filipino community gather at the basketball court and they have picnics and they play basketball all day. That is their regular Saturday thing. It's lovely. Yeah. And really it becomes like this kind of it's not just a basketball hoop anymore. It's like this like gathering spot and like a point of reference for everyone um, to kind of come together, which I think is really beautiful. There's a really important comment. Yeah, there's a really important comment in the, the chat about um, who has the, who has the, the uh, privilege to fuck up. I saw that. I think, that. I think that's really like something for us to sit with and to think about like sometimes the degree gives you the blazer to fuck up, like the architecture thing beside your name but also, you know, systemic racism and like intersectional challenges like mean that different people like I am absolutely able to fuck up in ways that other people can't because I present as a white cis male um, and the world we happen to live in right now, which is fucking shitty. Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree. definitely agree. Um, yeah, I thought that was a really important um, comment that Moji made. Um, I think we'll we'll have to highlight that like in our on our website or something because yeah. I think that's something we often forget. And um, uh, I guess even in the communities we grow up within and um, our own family dynamics, like you, you just never know. Um, what other people are kind of facing and like how, maybe the way that they grew up they were um, by either family members or like their community members and and so that kind of affects how much you're also like once you grow up like how much you're also able to kind of face like wanting to make change and to um, step outside of like your comfort zone because you've been told your whole life that it's not right. You can't. Um, it's like not a place for you to have this have a voice in. So, yeah, I, I would agree. As um, and I don't know if uh, other people share the sentiment, but certainly growing up as uh, sort of the like the millennial or Gen Z, if you will, of uh, and also being a minority, a visible minority. Uh, we are not encouraged to um, experiment or or um, burst out of what is considered like a, a acceptable professions even or or profession or social practices and I certainly deal with a, a lot of uncomfortableness of that um there's kind of like a, a joke uh running in my family it's like what are your parents what kind of things are your parents most proud of uh, or jobs that your parents would be most proud of and it's like doctor engineer lawyer because <laughs> like, that's that's what they know and being um that's but that's because that's what they saw as uh these people that were already here those were the most successful people and uh delving into per, a profession that likes experimentation or likes to sort of push boundaries of what's okay of what's allowed to be built or what's allowed to be done um is a constant state of discomfort but it's taken me some time to be okay with that yeah, I definitely agree on that. And like even within our own project and studio, like being able to just kind of take risks and like not worry about messing up and like not worry about what other people are thinking about you messing up or like a weird idea you wanted to try, I think it is very rooted in the way that um, like you're brought up as well. Yeah, to comment on what Emily and Cindy said, I think um, especially coming, like growing up in like an immigrant family, I think our parents have a very different perception of what 
uh, post-secondary education means. It's definitely like degree equals job, job equals survival. So exploring like a different range of um, understandings of what that education could, I guess, like lead you towards. It's a very different sensibility that I think a lot of a lot of BIPOC also struggle with um, because this this way of educating yourselves and sort of defining your career it's it's very different. It's more about like self actualization than it is about sort of just like scrapping together something so you can get a job, climb the ranks, retire. So I think it's, it also lends to that conversation about um, the barriers that you face, where all of these barriers, they're, we, we perceive them, but we have no sort of, um, no sort of a range of perspectives to even know that there's something on the other side. So I think part of having really open conversations about like the way that we do work, the way we get to places, even conversations around like wage transparency or um, all those things, they really help to eliminate these, um, these borders. And I don't know, it's a way to achieve solidarity amongst those who have never been able to like understand this way of like actualizing what you want to do in life. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, and on the topic of conversations, like even like having, if you're able to like have a conversation with your parents and like really be vulnerable and um, hopefully like they're at a place that they can also be equally as vulnerable and like having that open conversation. So even though it's like, yeah, I mean, you guys instilled these ideas into me, it's, at least now you're at a, a a level point where you kind of understand where each other's coming from. And I know that can be very idealistic, um, but I don't know, hopefully in like in your lifetime, like that's something that you're able to do and kind of um, figure out and they're able to kind of understand you a bit better. Um, and like ultimately they just want like the best for you, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a hard thing to navigate for sure. And I don't think it comes in one conversation. That's a lesson that I've learned recently um, over and over again. Uh, it's just, uh, it's, it's having, like, I have empathy for people that are not in my field and people that are not of my generation. And I try to understand where they're coming from and where their perceptions are coming from. And also making sure that there's room for myself and other people like me to share what our perspectives are and where they differ like because there always will be friction and there always will be conflict but can we just come to an understanding that I see you as a human you see me as a human we may not agree on things but can we work together to come up with a good relationship at the end of the day I'm sorry but I must hop over to studio uh, <laughs> but oh, yeah. I loved this conversation yeah. uh, thank you uh, for inviting John and I yeah. yeah, thanks so much for the invite. It was super exciting to jump on the panel, meet everyone, and talk about stuff and see some liked interests and, and, and things like that. It's good to have a conversation. Yeah. Yeah, thanks again, guys. All the best. Thanks, thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you.